morning, everybody. Amen. Praise God. It's good to be together again this morning at the beginning of this week of worship and study. At the beginning this morning, I want to challenge us with a two-part message. Part one this morning, part two tomorrow. Let me begin right there. Alex Haley, in his book, Roots, tells the story of the night Pinto Kunte drove his master to a ball on a neighboring plantation. He sat in the buggy, watched the master walk inside, and then leaned back to wait out the long night of revelry. Suddenly, his ear picked up the sound of a familiar music. It was not music from the ballroom. It struck a chord with him. He found his feet taking him down a path toward the slave quarter. And he met a man there from his home village, the village he had not seen since he was a little boy. And a flood of memories overwhelmed him. The man was playing on a makeshift instrument a music from his home village that he had not heard for more than 40 years. The men embraced and they talked through the night. They sang songs together. And for the first time in years, Kunta Kinte felt his old self again. That night, when he went back to his empty shack, he sat in the dark alone and he wept aloud. He cried because he had almost forgotten. He wept because he finally remembered. He remembered who he was. There is an analogy to the spiritual life. Because just like that old slave, we too are prone to forget who we are. And it is bondage that causes us to lose our identity. In his case, the bondage of slavery. In our case, the bondage of sin. Captivity has a way of confusing us. So we identify ourselves with the oppressor. And forget our true calling. So we too need a jolt from the past to set us straight, to remind us who we're really looking at when we look in the mirror. I want to talk to us this morning on this message entitled Remembering Who We Are. Take your Bible and join me in Exodus chapter 12. What book did I say, everybody? Exodus, Exodus chapter 12. Let's look at 29 to 33. And then chapter 13, verse 19. Exodus 12, verses 29 to 33. And then in chapter 13, one verse, verse 19. Remembering who we are. And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Then he called for Moses and Aaron by night. And he said, rise up, go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Also, take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. And the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we shall all be dead. 1319. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had placed the children of Israel under solemn oath, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here with you. As our story opens, the Egyptian mothers are crying inconsolably, each one holding in her lap a dead son. 
It has been a night of unimaginable horror in Egypt. The destroying angel has passed through, cutting down the firstborn of every family, from the palace to the shanty, from the mansion to the dungeon, there is not one home where there is not one dead. God has answered Pharaoh's stubbornness with a devastating blow. And as they listen to the cries of the Egyptian mothers, the children of Israel tremble and embrace their own sons, for they know were it not for the blood on the doorposts of their homes, they too would be in mourning. The blood has saved them. When God confronted Adam and Eve in the garden after sin, he came shedding blood. And when John looked through space-time into the throne room of God, he saw a lamb stained with blood. In Genesis, blood. In Revelation, blood. And all the way through in Scripture, from beginning to front, there is blood shed for our sins. And it is not the blood of bulls and goats. It is the precious blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God. Amen. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. It is the blood that saves us from our sin. That same blood applied to the lintels and doorposts of our hearts sets us free from the condemnation of sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, and it doesn't mean the first death. It means the second death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through whom, everybody? Jesus through Christ. Jesus Christ our Lord. It is by the blood. It is the only thing that will get us out of this world alive. The blood of Jesus. The power to overcome sin is in the blood. The strength to live a Christ-centered life is in the blood. And the promise of forgiveness of all of our sins is staked on the blood of Jesus. It is greater than any sin or all sin combined. It will never fail. It will never be used up, and it will never lose its power. Thank God for the precious blood of Jesus Christ. As their hearts revel in the joy of liberation, the Israelites eat their first Passover of roast lamb. It is an urgent meal. God has commanded them to eat it standing with their staffs in hand. He says, this is the night that you are going through. And so it is that the hard-hearted Pharaoh finally gives in and orders the Israelites out of his country to go and worship their God, as they have said. And the promise made under the stars to Abraham 400 years earlier comes to pass. The children of Israel are free at last. But as the people hurriedly pack with visions of milk and honey in their heads, something unexpected happens. Moses gets up and puts a halt to all the preparation. A far off look comes into his eye as he remembers an ancient promise older than the captivity itself. A voice sounds in his ear and, old, and Moses remembers and he gives orders for a grave to be opened and a body to be exhumed. There are only a few precious hours to get everything done with Pharaoh breathing down their necks but Moses takes the time to dig up the bones of an old patriarch who has been dead for 200 years. The spade is turned, the ground is disturbed, and the remains of Joseph are disentombed. Joseph, the dreamer, you remember him? The one who dreamed those dreams about the sun, moon, and stars, about the sheaves bowing down to him, Joseph who entered Egypt as a slave and ended up prime minister. Moses digs up his body. As he lay on his deathbed, 110 years old, knowing his time was almost gone, Joseph made his brothers swear that when God brought them out of Egypt, they would carry his bones with them. This final dream of the dreamer was not for himself. It was a dream in which he appeared only as a mummy. This dream was for God's people. Joseph knew that God would keep his promise.
the promise to Abraham. And that the act of digging up his body from the ground would stir up lost memories for the people of Israel. His bones would reconnect them to their history, reestablish their faith link to the forgotten God of the covenant, and remind the people of who they really were. His bones would be a memorial to bring Israel back to their true identity. Joseph says, God is going to come for you. And when you leave here, don't leave me behind. Dig up my bones and take me home to Canaan with you. That act reminded the people of who they were. It was a memorial. Read the Bible, we find out God is very fond of memorials. He sets up many of them. He knows how easily we forget, so he gives us reminders. After the children of Israel cross through the Jordan, he commands them to set up 12 stones in the middle of the river to remind them of that cross. He commands the people to build an altar at Ebenezer. They remember how God intervened and fought their enemies for them. God knows how soon we forget. He knows we can't even remember to dial a telephone exchange without checking the number at least twice. Sometimes we forget our own phone number. But God gives us memorials. The Sabbath is memorial too, which God has given to remind us of his sovereign rule as creator of heaven and earth, to remind us that he is the one who makes us holy. We need memorials or we too are prone to forget who we are. So Joseph makes them sweat. Look at his words of read, Genesis 50, the last chapter of Genesis 50. Verses 24 to 26. These are Joseph's last words before he died. Genesis 50, 5, 0, 24 to 26. The Bible says, And Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Joseph has spent his entire adult life living as an Egyptian. He lived in Egyptian territory. He married an Egyptian woman. He governed as an Egyptian ruler, but he never forgot his true identity. With his dying instruction, he showed that even though he had lived his whole adult life far from home, he always remembered who he was. Beloved, we need reminders too of our identity, lest we forget our special calling as disciples of Jesus Christ. The first word for church, that is used in the New Testament is the New Testament word ecclesia. I want you to say it with me. The word is ecclesia. That word is the first word used for church in the New Testament. Jesus is the first one to use it in Matthew 16. He says, upon this rock I will build my what everybody? Ecclesia. My ecclesia, church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You know what that word means? Ecclesia, the name for church? It means the called out ones. Ecclesia, the called out one. This is Christ's church. Not a building, not a denomination, but a people whom God by his grace has called out of alienation from God back into oneness with God. Called out of the love of the world into citizenship with God's kingdom. The name is a reminder of our new identity in Jesus Christ. It's the idea of separation, not called in, but called out, ecclesia. That's who we are. That word is a reminder that this world is not our home. Zambia is not our true citizenship nor the UK, nor America, nor South Africa, nor Australia, nor any other nation. 
These are the places of our temporary abode while we wait for our mansions to be complete. But they are not our final home. We must remember that we are aliens down here, living not on passports, but on visas. We must remember that we are never to accommodate the world to the extent that we assimilate the world. The old Christian adage says that we should be in the world, but what everybody? Not of the world. It's not living apart from the world off somewhere as a hermit in some shanty, not having contact with anybody else. That's not it. Jesus didn't live his life that way. Jesus lived among the people, in the world, but at the same time, not of the world, not partaking of its values, not partaking of its pleasures in the world, but not of the world. Joseph, Joseph lived in Egypt, but he was not an Egyptian. Moses grew up in the palace, but he did not belong to the royal family. Jesus was from Nazareth, but his kingdom was not of this world. There is to be a distinction about us as Christians, a certain something that causes us to not quite fit in down here. Because we belong to another kingdom. We need to remember who we are. Who says amen to that? Amen. Beloved? Some of us have become way too comfortable down here. We've become attached. We've allowed our affections to be set on things below instead of things above, Colossians 3, 2. We have adopted worldly values and lived our lives in accordance with them. We have embraced worldly dreams and built our futures around them. Our ambitions have changed from saving the world to save me a place in the world. We have stopped teaching our children how to make a difference and are now teaching them instead how to fit in, how not to rock the boat so they can be successful down here, instead of how to challenge the system in order to be faithful down here. Jesus never quite fit in when he was down here. And he never experienced what the world called success. He was too busy being faithful to be successful. We have forgotten who we are. My wife and I were talking with an old schoolmate a few years ago. Hadn't seen her for a while. And she was talking about the plot of ground she had purchased and the dream house she planned to build, describing it to us, what it would look like, how many rooms, how she intended to decorate it. And then while she was talking, without realizing it, it slipped out and she said, I hope Jesus doesn't come before I get to build my house. She caught herself then, but it was too late, it had already come out. She'd gotten so caught up in her earthly project that her heart had become more attached to her dream house than to the mansions in heaven. She'd lost her identity. She'd forgotten who she was. When we get together at our reunion, after having not seen family members or friends for years and years, what do we talk about? Do we brag about how our children have become successful doctors and lawyers and engineers and are now moving in powerful circles and living in big houses? If that is the focus of our lives, if that's what we talk about when we get back together, that's a sign that we've forgotten who we are. I'm trying to help somebody out, go get mad at me. Need to examine ourselves. Let me show you something. You know this book. Look at Luke 17 in your Bible. Come on, join me, church. Don't, don't get weary of it. Luke 17, 28 to 32. I'm not quite done yet. This is hard to hear, but we got to hear some more of it yet. I'm not done. Luke 17, 28 to 32. I'm talking about remembering who we are. This is Jesus speaking. He's talking about the second coming. He says, Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they fought, 
they sowed, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, look at this part now, 31. Christ is describing detachment now. In that day, he says, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Then he says in 32, ominously, remember Lot's wife. Christ is describing detachment. He does not say it's wrong to have a house. He doesn't say it's a sin to have things. He says, don't become attached to them. So when the time comes for you to escape, you can leave them all behind and go where I send you. Don't become attached. Remember Lot's wife. That was her problem. She got so attached to Sodom and to the things that she had accumulated that even when holy angels from heaven came to get her, they could not persuade her to leave for her own salvation. It's a story for Christians, a story of the last days. Mrs. Lot was the charter member of the church of Laodicea, rich and increased with goods, but did not know that she was wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. We need an identity check. When we sit down with our paycheck and calculate how much stuff we can buy instead of how much good we can do, we have forgotten who we are. When we take more pride in our national anthem than in the songs of Zion, we have forgotten who we are. It is not just a matter of forsaking the sin of the world. We are called to forsake the whole world because no one can serve to says amen to God. Amen. Amen. One more verse I want you to read. James 4.4. 4. Turn your Bible to James 4.4. 4. Right near the end of your Bible. So the, the apostle here is talking about this subject of choosing between the kingdom of God and the world. He writes here, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. We need to dig up some bones from our past to remind ourselves of our heritage, not in Abraham, not in Africa, not in America, but our heritage in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are Zambians, we are Kenyans, we are Americans, but we are Christians first. And our devotion to Jesus Christ as our Lord and, and our devotion to his mission reorders all of our priorities, reshapes all of our relationships, and all of the affiliations of our lives. When Moses dug up Joseph's bones, he knew they would serve as a memorial of God's providence in the history of Israel. He knew he would remind them of God's unfailing faithfulness to his word, that when he promises, he always delivers. And though his word may sometimes seem long in fulfilling, we discover that when it does come to pass, it is always right on time. Joseph's faith in the certainty of the Exodus would strengthen Israel's faith in the certainty of the promised land. Where shall we look for our memorial? To whom shall we go? In Acts chapter 11, the Bible tells the story of how the believers first came to the city of Antioch. The Bible says Paul and Barnabas came there, and they began a ministry there. The Bible says they stayed for a whole year. They raised up a household of believers. They fellowshiped with them, discipled them, taught them for a whole year. And there in Antioch, for the first time, they were given an official name. Say with me now, church. For years, the disciples of Jesus as a body did not have a name. The church was raised up on the day of Pentecost 
right there in Jerusalem. You know the story. Peter baptized 3,000. The church grew and grew and grew, thousands of thousands. The apostles went out to preach all around the area, and they never had an organized church or an official name. People just called them the way. But then, when they came to Antioch and built up the body of Christ there and spent a year among the people there, a name was given to them. They did not choose it themselves. It was chosen for them by outsiders and onlookers. And they called them Christians. You know why? They said, because they remind everybody of Christ. And that became their official name. Christians. Why? Because they reminded people of Christ. That's a beautiful name. Here is the name given in scripture for the followers of Jesus Christ. Christians, we are Christians. It is a name particularly suited to our identity because Christ is our whole life. We are the people who see the world and who experience reality through the person of Jesus Christ. Christianity is not just what we do. Christianity is who we are. When we speak of remembering who we are, this is our answer. We are Christians. The people of Jesus Christ. Only Christians are so consumed with their love for Christ that they lose their identity in his identity. And so say things like this, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 121. Or things like this, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 127. What about this one from 2 Corinthians 2? For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. Then one of my favorites, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. That's our identity. Christians, we are the people of Christ. We need to remember who we are. Everything else we know, everything else we do, we analyze, we interpret through the lens of Jesus Christ, who is our whole life. This is who we are. Our identity is a person, not a country, not a culture, not a race, and not a denomination. We are Christians, and we are Christians first. We need to remember who we are. Somebody asked, well, what about Adventism? If all we have to think about is that we're Christians, then what about all the dozens and dozens of Christian churches throughout the world? Does it not matter which one we belong to as long as we're Christian? Where does Adventism fit in? That's tomorrow's message. Right now, I want to end with this. When we think of our identity, the first thing that must come to mind is Jesus Christ. He defines us. He's the one who tells us who we are. When we forget, when we get distracted, when we get caught up with things down here, we need to turn our focus back to Jesus and remember who we are. Amen. Who believes God? Who says amen to God? Amen. Let me close with this. It's an unusual story, true story, out of Orangeburg, South Carolina, back in the States my wife's hometown, but she had nothing to do with this story, I promise you. A 74-year-old woman who lived alone died of natural causes in her bed all by herself. Her husband had died 20 years earlier, and they had no children. Her only sibling, a sister, had lost contact. They never communicated. And so Mary Sue Merchant, at the age of 74, died alone and laid in her bed for 18 months before anybody missed her. The neighbors did not notice she was gone. Her electricity had been cut off for unpaid bills. And her home had even been sold in auction for unpaid taxes. And there she lie in her bed, dead for 18 
18 months and nobody knows. Nobody even knew she was there. Beloved, that's a metaphor for the Christian church. Because when we get caught up in the things of the world, spiritual death can happen to us too, a death that nobody notices and not even us. When we get caught up in the things of the world and forget our true identity, spiritual death creeps up on us and we ourselves don't even know that we have lost our spiritual life. So we must keep our focus. We must zero in on Jesus Christ himself and remember, remind ourselves of our true identity in him. We need to remember who we are. Who says amen to God's word? Amen. Tomorrow morning at this same time, I'm going to talk about Adventism. I'm going to talk about how it fits into the question of identity and mission. I want to continue this conversation with you from the word of God. And I want you to pray about it overnight and get ready to hear a confrontational word from God's book. There's no point in reading God's book if we're afraid of confrontation. Because Jesus is always confronting us with his truth. Going to do the same tomorrow morning. I want to ask you to pray about that. I want to close this service with a prayer, and I want to pray for us today as we close out, as we think about our lives and our commitment to Christ, as we think about our relationship to the world and whether or not we've been faithful to Jesus in everything as Christians. I want to invite us to think about that and to pray for a moment in silence about our commitment to Jesus. And if we discover as we search our hearts that we have lost our identity by becoming distracted by some worldly thing, let's take a minute now to confess it, to repent of our sin without making excuses, and recommit ourselves to our true identity in Christ. I'm going to take one minute of silent prayer, and then I'm going to close with a prayer for us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we think about the word of God to us today from your holy book, as we apply it to our own individual lives, we have cause, Lord, to confess and repent to you, to apologize to you. We have not been as faithful to you as you have been to us. And we beg your pardon, Lord, we're sorry about that. We realize how we've been distracted so easily by worldly things how we have set our affections on worldly dreams, Lord. How we've been caught up in the values and the pleasures and the passions of the world. And in doing so, God, we have betrayed you and we apologize to you. We're sorry we ask you to forgive us. And then, Lord, by the power of your spirit, we ask you to bring us back to our first love. That time in our lives when we first gave our hearts to you and we gave ourselves to you with everything in us and everything in our strength. We remember how we used to be about every little detail of our lives, Lord, in the light of your love. We want to come back to that place. We ask you to bring us back, Lord, to our first love. To remember who we really are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, thank you for giving us this chance. Accept our repentance and transform us by the power of your spirit. Keep us now, Lord, till we meet again in this place. May your name be glorified as we live our lives. And we thank you for hearing us. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let all the church say together. Amen.